the 1st of October, 2019, mass protests spread through Iraq. People demanded an end to widespread corruption and access to basic services like water and electricity and access to jobs. Within days, hundreds of protesters were injured, there were dozens of fatalities, and then the Iraqi government imposed a near blackout of the internet. Iraq is not alone. Venezuela, Sudan, Zimbabwe, Myanmar, Ethiopia, Bangladesh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Egypt, Indonesia, Iran, and Sudan are some of the 33 countries who have tried to shut down or throttle the internet in 2019 alone. India was a leader in the practice with 121 shutdowns that year. You're listening to Beyond the Headlines. I'm Taylor Heyman, and this week we're asking, should access to the internet be recognized as a basic human right? So first off, what is a human right? A human right is something that protects the conditions of minimally decent lives. So most of them are protected by international law, but beyond what's codified international law, we can also, of course, explore and discover um, certain rights that should be created, that should exist. But human rights in general are matters of international concern. That was Merton Reglitz, a lecturer in global ethics at Birmingham University in the UK. He released a study last year which argues free internet access should be considered a basic human right. Human rights as a concept are centuries old, as far back as 539 BC. Cyrus the Great conquered Babylon, freed the slaves, and declared that all people had the right to choose their own religion and establish racial equality. But human rights change over time. The right to water and sanitation was only recognised by the UN in 2010. We spoke to Bohan Taye, a senior policy advisor from Access Now, an organization focused on defending the digital rights of people around the world. The way I see the internet and the internet infrastructure is very similar ways that I see the water infrastructure that we have in our cities, electricity infrastructure, school. Um, there are many other infrastructures that government are responsible for and, or, or are, are expected to facilitate so that citizens and residents and refugees and everybody within your border has access to it. So for me, I see it from that perspective. To some people, it may not seem that the internet is comparable to water or electricity, or even apply to what Merton earlier described as maintaining a minimally decent life. There are plenty of people who willingly spend little to no time on the internet. To some, it may not seem that access to TikTok or YouTube are as necessary as running water. But here's Merton again. The world has changed a lot. And just because things worked before the internet in different ways doesn't mean that they work now the same way. Um, If we don't have internet access today, that is very problematic because because other people do. Uh, And I think another thing to keep in mind is how basic internet has become Um, we can see during the COVID-19 lockdowns. So people having social contacts at all only because they go online, people being able to to exercise their political freedoms at all um, because they can go online, or people being able to work securely during lockdowns at all because they have internet access. So I think it's created a fallback infrastructure, um, a really important basic infrastructure for our societies which is not a luxury, but which can enhance um, human rights and human well-being if it's uh, regulated uh, and provided correctly. And so to deny that internet access is valuable would just basically deny all of these opportunities, um, which seems just straight out wrong. It is not just the social contact or the ability to earn a living that concerns Merton. His research into the topic links the internet with other basic rights. Internet access helps realize many, many rights. So it's uh, one particular thing that's unlike other things in a sense that it doesn't just help realize free speech or doesn't help realize just free assembly. The important thing to keep in mind is that if we have internet access, we have many more opportunities to realize those rights. 
So for instance, um, if I uh, ha have no internet access, then I'm limited to um, offline ways of speaking in public. Um, that might be at a town hall meeting. In London, it might be at Speaker's Corner. And so there are these kind of opportunities. I could also send readers comments to a newspaper, um, but I don't have the same opportunities to reach the same audience um, that people with internet access have. And if we think that it's not just important that people have human rights like free speech and free assembly, but that it also matters um, that we have adequate opportunities for realizing those rights, then digital inequality means that there is an objectionable degree in inequalities of opportunities to realize many of our crucial human rights. So for Merton, the rights to freedom of thought and expression and the rights to public assembly are all linked to having access to the internet. For Berhan, another principal concern is access to education, especially as the world contends with the coronavirus pandemic. And then, of course, if you, if you go out of the refugee camps, what you see is that, uh, and again in Kashmir and Jammu, where the rest of the country in India has gone, you know, the students have gone online, they're uh, taking their classes, they're sitting for their ex exams. Uh, you know, life has changed, but they're still able to at least be students, as, at least, you know, expect to graduate at the end of the year. In, in Jammu and Kashmir, in, in, in Myanmar, internet has been shut down. In Pakistan, these students are not doing any courses and they're expected to sit at home and wait until the government uh, decides to, to let them, you know, continue their education, to let them continue their life. Um, you know, a lot of people, their work has been affected. Um, so that's what we're seeing with, with COVID and, 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 and internet shutdowns at this time. Saman Latif, a reporter at the Tribune newspaper in Kashmir, describes the impact the shutdown and slowdowns have had on his family. The, the kids, the children, they're the worst hit in this, in this uh, lockdown. Uh, look, my nephew, he's in 10th class and uh, he has not been to school since August, August, since August last year. Recently, his school in North Kashmir, in Sopur, uh, they had started his online classes. Uh, he told me he could not see his teacher during the class. Uh, even the, the voice was not the, the voice was not audible. Then finally, the they they stopped the the online classes because internet speed is very low. At times, it has it is being blocked completely. But now, for, since March, it has it, internet has been restored, but the speed is very low. Where people can children cannot actually have access to the uh, online classes. They cannot. They don't have. They don't have that uh, liber, uh, lux, luxury to actually have online classes to learn through online uh, teaching and all. For me, it's like uh, government of India is like, it's enforced, enforced illiteracy, I call it, particularly the computer illiteracy on our children. And the combination of a global pandemic and an internet shutdown offers an even bigger threat. Bahan worries the COVID-19 outbreak poses a greater risk for those without internet access. So can you imagine you're sitting there as a doctor trying to figure out how, how, am I go, how am I supposed to handle these patients that I have in the ICU? And you have to wait six, seven, four, five hours to download a single document that you'd normally be able to download in 20 minutes or in 10 minutes, given your internet connection, just because the government has decided to censor that content. So these are some of the things that we've seen. And in, in Bangladesh, the ref refugees were telling us, we know there's, there's this thing that has come, it's called coronavirus, it is COVID, we know, people, we know we've been warned. But we can't share any information with anybody. We can't go around and tell 900,000 refugees about COVID. We have to use social media. We have to use other channels to be able to share that. So what the government in Bangladesh, when the, when the COVID started, what they did was they turned on the internet for an hour because they know how important the internet is for passing on information. They told people there's this disease called coronavirus. You should protect yourself this way and then switched it off. Now, we've seen this in Pakistan. We've seen this in, in other places as well. Um, you know, you're bargaining with with the lives of people, uh, and most what you know what what's really even again, what's really concerning is you're bargaining with with the lives of the most vulnerable. But in 2017, the UN Human Rights Council condemned states intentionally preventing or disrupting access to information online as a violation of international human rights law. Some governments have argued that shutting down access to the internet during the pandemic is necessary to stop the spread of dangerous misinformation. But when the pandemic passes, the links between internet access and a loss of other rights will still be there. Here's Bahan again. 
from my perspective, one of the things that that is really dangerous when the internet goes off is that you know governments are going to use excessive force and nobody's going to be watching or nobody's going to be recording. That's not going to be live streamed. But what we're seeing now is there's a direct correlation between the internet going off deliberately and human rights violation escalating. So we've seen this in Burundi when they had an election. We've seen this in Togo. We've seen this in Guinea where now it's actually, it's, it's, it's a trigger point where you, when the internet goes off, you know human rights violations are going to happen. Bahan's work at Access Now involves documenting the instances where governments have intentionally cut off access to the internet for some or all of the people in the country. When there are demonstrations or protests, or when injustice occurs, social media becomes a powerful tool to document what is happening. Many governments shut down or throttle internet speeds in the hopes of shutting down exposure. Take Myanmar, for example. Areas of the provinces of Rakhine and Chin marked a whole year without internet access. The nine townships blocked from the online world house the persecuted minority Rohingya people. You know, protests are, um, you know, one of, one of the highest triggers of uh, an internet shutdown. So, and there are many reasons why Governments, of course, want to shut down the internet. Why they want to, um, why they, why they would want people to congregate and protest on the streets. Um, so one of the reason is, in most cases, what we've seen is that you know the minute people are out on the streets and demanding uh, for change or demanding something, uh, normally you know law enforcement comes in, and then as we've seen in Iraq, as we've seen in Sudan, as we've seen in Ethiopia, and I can go ahead on the list. There are many countries that do this. They arrest, beat, and in some contexts use excessive force. Some people, some protesters are killed. So the ability to, I think one of the critical things here is that the ability to, to live stream that and the outrage that comes from that both internally in the country, but also you know, internationally is not something that governments want. The internet has been used as a tool for protests to go global. The death of George Floyd a 46-year-old black man killed after a police officer knelt on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds sparked protests not just across the US, but globally. Here's Merton again. Another very recent example, for instance, is the killing of George Floyd. So internet access is not necessary uh, on its own for in, for protecting our basic human rights, like to bodily integrity, there can be other means, but it helps protect those interests and those human rights because it lets us all contribute to protecting those human rights. If internet access wouldn't have been widespread in the US and people wouldn't have had the devices for recording what was going on there, um, we would have had to hope that some camera team, some reporters would have been close by to capture this moment Otherwise, it could have been disputed. Otherwise, uh, there would have been uh, much more of a possibility for um, the people involved to deny what happened going on. So here also, internet access and the internet as such has helped people to protect uh, crucial human rights, not of George Floyd, of course, not his rights, but it can help create a situation uh, which forces accountability and forces transparency, making all of our lives more secure. Although intentional government shutdowns are extremely problematic, they are not the only reason people don't have access to the internet. Lack of connectivity and affordability are problems in even the most wealthy parts of the world. Here's Bahan again. The fact that you know, when we ask you know, who's not connected to the internet, it's the same way as electricity and water. Right, like the, or, or health, access to health, to be honest. So the rural parts of the countries would rarely have a level five hospital that you can do surgeries in. Um, so all of those things are really um, a reflection of society and where we decide to invest. And it's very similar to other infrastructures that we're talking of. Merton adds that if access to the internet is reserved for the wealthy and access is limited for the most vulnerable, this leads to an inevitable future. I think there will be greater inequalities because those who can avail themselves of the internet uh, and the opportunities it gives will have uh, definitely many more opportunities to improve their situation. Um, and that's exactly the point of giving universal internet access, that people have more equal opportunities, adequate opportunities for protecting uh, and promoting and realizing their own human rights. So inequality is, um, is one 
problem. And we know from studies of the global digital divide, which uh, tracks uh, different, connect different connectivity in different parts of the world, that people without internet access um, have less opportunities, economic opportunities, educational opportunities. It means that people who don't have this access uh, have less opportunities to connect with the global economy, um, e-commerce, uh, and uh, the Indian state of Kerala, for instance, recognized uh, the internet access as a human right because it said um, if students don't have internet access, they are disadvantaged uh, in their educational efforts and they fall behind their peers because they don't have the op they can't avail themselves of the opportunities that the internet offers. So, what challenges lie ahead for bringing internet access to the masses? To be connected to the internet, it has to be profitable for the telecom service provider, for the internet service provider that is giving that service. Uh, in the ways that our cities are connected, for instance, and what we normally call the digital redlining is that um, in, the, in the areas that I live in, in Nairobi, the, you know, the affluent areas have internet connection. You can choose from one, two, three service providers. If you go to the less affluent areas, uh, if, you, you know, if you're lucky, there will be one. There will, there will be one internet service provider, and I'm talking about broadband connection here. Um, and if you're not lucky, there won't be any, so you have to depend on your mobile internet. Merson feels there are more proactive steps governments can take. It will vary on how affluent a country is, I think. So a good similarity here, a good analogy is here, the, the human right to health. There are certain core obligations that all states should uh, fulfill. And then there's a call to progressively realize that. So what an affluent developed nation um, is supposed to offer in terms of universal access will look different than what a developing country has to offer, at least initially. But still, it could start by having access to the internet freely in public libraries and so on. Activists have argued that tech giants should step in to fill the void. Some companies are acting. Facebook's founder Mark Zuckerberg has said he views access as a human right and has set up a connectivity lab to work on providing internet access for the masses. Meanwhile, Google has been working on beaming the internet from high-altitude balloons, and Microsoft is looking at deploying internet through television airwaves. One thing is for sure. When you've experienced the power of the internet, there is no going back. Here's Cliff Akinde in Cameroon after the internet was switched back on in the rest of Anglophone region in 2017, after 136 days. The government has made further shutdowns and slowed internet speeds in 2018, 2019 and 2020. Oh my God, I am, I am so, so excited. You know, it, it, I feel like I'm, I'm back alive. You know, I'm connected back to the whole world. It's been a while. You know, for, for about four months now, I have not been able to chat with friends abroad and, you know, get connected with people. But now I am so happy that finally we have internet back in Southwest. This is Beyond the Headlines. I've been your host, Taylor Heyman. Thank you to our guests this week, Berhan Taye, Dr. Merton Reglitz and Saman Latif. This week's show has been produced by Arthur Edison, Aisha Khan and Erica el -Kershi. To subscribe to Beyond the Headlines, tap the subscribe button in your favourite podcasting app.